Thank you, Stephanie. So, Alexa, I know you just got introduced. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about you? Uh, sure, so I can uh, recap the food spotting story in a sentence or two. Um, I came up with the idea for food spotting while traveling a few years ago, now like five or six years ago, um, and just discovering all these Japanese dishes that I had never heard about growing up and just realizing how many dishes were out there no one's ever heard of. So I actually woke up with a book idea, and I wanted to write a book that was basically like a field guide for food, so like a bird guide, bird identification <laughs> guide, but for food where it's like, what is this? Where can you find it? What does it taste like? Um, and the more I told that idea to people, the more people were like, oh, that would be a great app that lets you actually find the food and try it. Um, and so that book idea turned into an app idea, but actually just this month, we celebrated the launch of the food spotting book. So, so the book did happen, it's all come full circle now. Actually, that's around the time that I met Alexa. So when we were actually thinking of the book, and we were like, no, make an app. Go to Start a Weekend. Um, <laughs> right? So actually, how did it, you know, you told people they said it should be an app, but from from taking this idea into an actual app, like from that idea to, to, to being a launch app, what was that true? Yeah, so when I first came up with the idea, um, it was one of those ones that kind of stuck with me, and so uh, one of the things that I did and that I would encourage all of you to do is just talk about the idea to everyone who will listen. Um, and so I, would, I was just sharing it with first with coworkers, people who were bound, and then um, I met Sana at like a tech conference sometime and I told it to her and she was like, oh, you should check out Women 2.0, Girls in Tech, and some of these communities um, because you know, there's people there who can actually help you make your idea real. Um, and to me that was like an eye-opening moment was like, because uh, I, I was thinking this would be like a personal side project, you know, like starting a um, you know, this personal thing. And I hadn't really thought, like, I want to start a business or I want to start a startup. Um, but I talked to her and realized, like, hey, people are actually going to these events, meeting people, teaming up and making things real. I was like, wow. Um, and so I joined the Women 2.0 uh, course and uh, started learning a little bit about entrepreneurship and how to take an idea from concept to reality. Um, what that course helped me do was really craft the story and tell that story really well. So it wasn't just me talking about random ideas, but you know, honing in on like what's my two second elevator pitch and how can I refine that through conversation. So um, you know, that was a big part of that journey and then learning to tell it in 10 slides or less. 10 slides with not filled with words, like simple and tell a clear story. Um, so that was a big step. So, so pitching, pitching a lot. Um, but how did you get to sort of that clear, like, what's your, your clear elevator pitch? Because there's a lot of people here who have lots of ideas, there's a problem they want to solve, there's thoughts about how they want to do it, and so when they get started, there's a, there's a long sort of period until you actually understand what they're doing, and that's, the, the pitching is, is a bit longer, right? You got it condensed to a very short, um, you know, strong value prop, I got it right away. You know, what was that process like, and what tips do you, can you give some of the people here? Yeah, so one of the first things that I did when I came up with the idea for the app version of Food Spotting was make a one-page poster that summarized all of my ideas for the app. And the parts of that poster were like the name of it, so it was Food Spotting. I had already come up with the idea. I think you helped come up with that idea, maybe. Um, and then uh, the, the tagline, which was like, you know, find and share great dishes, something like that. And then um, one paragraph elevator pitch, which tells you what it is, why it's different, and how it works all in one short paragraph. Because, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, like people get it when you tell them what's different from other things. So it's like Yelp, but for dishes, or things like that. Um, and then I had a list of inspirations all on this poster. But the main thing was that I illustrated the experience of using food spotting. So like walking actually down the Embarcadero, there's all these sushi restaurants, how do you know what's good? Um, and this lets you see what dishes are all around you and see what you're craving and find food that way. And I, would, I drew that through these little sketches. So um, if you Google, uh, I think, can you picture that as my name, I think you can find a picture of the poster. Um, so you're not an engineer. I believe you're, you know, you, you, and if you could share with the audience what your background was before that. And then from there to an app, you know, to hire a lot of engineers, convince them about the vision, get them excited, give them direction. How does that happen? Because there's a lot of women here who are not engineers, not technical, who also have an idea and they're thinking, wow, you know, how do I go about that? Yeah, so I took that 
poster actually, and I, I carried it around in my purse all the time. Like I put it on love my 17 and folded it up and carried it everywhere. So when I met people, especially if they're engineers, I would like pull out this poster <laughs> and I would tell them about the idea uh, for a fifth buddy. And uh, you know, I, I do think finding engineer co-founder is one of the most challenging things and the most challenging thing for me at first because my background's in design, um, but I hadn't worked a lot with engineers. So I didn't even know what to look for. Like I didn't know, uh, <laughs> I didn't know if it was if I wanted a you know, server ops engineer, front end engineer, dot net engineer. You know, I didn't know one from the other. So the first thing I did actually was look for someone who could help me interview and vet engineers. Um, and so I actually asked this, this guy Ted, um, you know, could you help me uh, find an engineer? Because I don't even know what to ask when I'm talking to people. And I've seen a lot of people actually find bad engineering co-founders, but not bad, but just the wrong fit. So like you don't need like a server's deep back-end engineer to build a product. Like you need someone who's built a product. Um, and so Ted agreed to help me meet up with engineers. And so he and I went and started interviewing a couple people together. And eventually, like the more we talked, and the more we realized he would be the perfect engineering <laughs> co-founder. And um, so one day, around the same time, he was leaving his job at a startup, get satisfaction. And I said, maybe you could be my engineering co-founder. <laughs> And a few weeks later, he said yes. yes. What happened in those few weeks? Was he deliberating? Were you continuously pitching him and selling him on it? What, what was that process? So actually, he kind of got, he was traveling and taking time off, and he got the urge to just like show how easy it would be to prototype this thing. Because we talked to all his engineers, and they're like, oh, it's hard, and this, this is hard, and that's hard, and that kind of thing. So he was like, no, it's not. I can, I can do this in a weekend. And so he was on a camping trip, and he actually helped put together a prototype of the app. <laughs> Which is, I mean, maybe he's unusual in that way, but it was kind of like, he was like, oh, this is so late. I could do this in a weekend, that kind of person. So, um, and meanwhile, I was actually going to more like tech events. So I went to uh, the Women 2.0 event that was uh, um, Startup Weekend. And I was still kind of looking for a co-founder because I didn't know if Ted would say yes. And I teamed up with a group there to continue to refine the idea. You were there, actually. <laughs> Funny. Um, and just continued to hone in on that idea. And we, um, I don't know, I, think, I don't think we won Startup Weekend, but like we got a lot of praise. And we had an angel investor offer. Yeah, you got, you got some it was like a second place or something oh. like that. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> um, Startup did yeah. survive, so uh, <laughs> and that was really encouraging, and I told Ted that that night, I'm like, we went to start a weekend, someone offered us $5,000, which I thought was so much at the time, because we were spending out of our own pocket, and, uh, and it was Dan Martell, yeah, who was like super connected to a lot of people who love food, actually, and um, that was really validating, and that was actually when Ted said yes, was after that night. So, would you say bragging or competition drove Ted? Yeah, like, yeah, maybe. maybe. Um, so actually that brings me a nice segue into culture, right? So, after Ted, there were other folks you hired. You built a company culture that still very much, you know, resonates and is a part of, everyone was part of that food spotting team, and that's why they committed and they stuck with it and made it what it is, right? So, was this your first experience managing people? and? What are some ways in which you incentivized everyone to, to do the type of job that they did? So I mean, the thing that makes finding engineers challenging is there's just like the pick of projects to work on out there. And you, know, you really have to find something that's close to people's hearts and does kind of appeal to that, like, I, I want to show off what I can do in nature. Um, so like one of our engineers was a data scientist and he did like a lot of like food genome project stuff where he was kind of showing off like the food interest graph and kind of just scientific -y stuff. Um, and so we found him and really, you know, we were able to reach him through that food angle. And that's the thing is like you really need to look for engineers on sites like AngelList, for example, who have a passion for the thing that you do first and foremost. Um, and that there's something, there, that it's clear to them that they can have some impact and shape it. So we were pretty flat all throughout food spotting. We grew up to about 10 people. Um, and, you know, Ted was really responsible for uh, a lot of the engineering, like managing, but it was very much empowering people to do what they love and letting that data scientist guy just do exploration that maybe didn't even make it into the product, but um, helped him to exercise that creativity um, that he cared about and things like that. And what's important really too is just meeting with everyone on your team one-on-one. -on -one. It's so easy to forget because as a founder, you have so many emails and so many meetings and so much to do that you can almost forget about your own team and think, oh, you know, Ted will take care of it, the engineers. 
but you know, they're most of the team. And so uh, one thing I wish I had done more actually is just make a regular habit of meeting with everyone one-on-one -on -one to see what they were craving from the company and what they wanted to do more of or less of or whatever. If you should continue in this, in this time, I assume this is somewhere after seed, right? Uh, in continuing to network a lot and going to tech events. And if so, like, did your, the quality of your networking change? Yeah, so the um, you know thing as food spotting evolved, it became more about looking for great partners for food spotting and telling stories about how we could partner and help out a food event or partner and help out a food book or an author and um, kind of the story shifted a little bit to be more about like how can food spotting work with you and how can we work together to help each other out. Um, and you know, one of the biggest success stories was we really wanted to get Anthony Bourdain's recommendations on food spotting, um, and so uh, we actually ended up hiring someone who was great at this connecting stuff, but what really sold the Travel Channel on the idea was this like elevator pitch of, wouldn't it be great if Anthony Bourdain's fans could see what dishes he loves everywhere they go? And, they, and Travel Channel realized like, there was no way to do that. Like You watch it on TV, you print out a guide, but it's really hard to know what's nearby. And we enabled them to do something they couldn't do. And we actually signed them on in like a month, which was pretty amazing. Um, raising money. You raise multiple rounds, right? What? I mean, what are some of the tips you can give people out there who are raising money? Uh, so first is telling that great story. Uh, the second, of course, is then um, finding people who share that story and that vision. Um, and one of the, I mean, when I was starting Food Spotting, Angel List was really new and nascent, but uh, it was still a great way to read the bios of all of these angel investors. Uh, so what I did was I just printed out all the bios of angel investors that looked in any way relevant or had invested in other consumer tech or mobile companies, um, and just kind of studied like what what do these people care about, what are they interested in, um, and then you know I try I reached out to people who knew them or who might know them that I also knew, and I realized that it was really important to build relationships, authentic relationships with other founders too, and to build that network so it's not just like um, like if. If somebody I don't know comes up and asks for an intro, like I'm gonna be like, oh, I don't really know you, and how can I refer you? But if you have an authentic relationship with other founders because you're meeting for lunch regularly, you're helping each other out, then you have people who can intro you and build those relationships. Um, so those are kind of two things, just AngelList and just building a network of fellow founders um, that help each other out. And then once I met those investors, it was important to really find investors that shared the story, that shared what we cared about. And I think, um, you no, know, of course, when you're raising money, you also want to just take whatever money you can get to some extent, too. But the best investors were the ones who cared about food spotting for what it was instead of uh, you know, something we kind of uh, adapted our pitch so that we'd please those investors or something like that. If we were like, oh, well, food spotting could be beyond food and be for fashion and travel and sports and whatever. Uh, but that wasn't our core interest area. It was the ones who really cared about food that we connected with um, and understood the problem we were trying to solve. So harder or <coughs> harder or easier as well if you raise money? Yeah. If whatever it was, how did you handle it? Yeah, for me personally I felt like um, there were there's actually there can be some unfair advantages to being a woman, which is having a great network. Like people <laughs> like the ones around you that are meeting together just to talk about being a woman in tech. And I felt like um, that was actually a, a benefit was having women 2.0, girls in tech, events like this um, that brought people together. So I actually felt uh, encouraged by having that network. And then, um, you know, occasionally there's some unfair advantages. Like you get invited to be on a panel just because you're a woman in tech. And hey, it's kind of a, could be, you could take that as annoying, but you can also see, hey, I'm on stage at F8 and other people aren't because I'm a woman in tech or whatever. And so it's kind of, I, I guess for me, I, I I wasn't afraid to just take advantage of those opportunities instead of kind of turning out my nose at them. And I felt like they were able to help us, help me and Fusby make some great connections with people in the industry. So how did you decide when to sell? And why did you sell to OpenTable? So uh, they always say you don't sell your company, your companies are bought, like people come looking for you. And one of the kind of magical parts about doing a startup is you just never know what's going to come in your email any day, what kind of opportunities. Um, so we actually had a couple of companies come to us over the course of the year that we sold. Um, and we actually got pretty far along with a company that really, looking back, would not have been one that shared our story. Like, that wasn't an authentic fit for what we were doing. 
um, you know, that cared about the te some aspect of the technology or the data science or whatever, but didn't care about the product we had built particularly. Um, and we almost sold to that company and then it ended up falling through for various reasons. Um, and at first we were like, oh, that's such a bummer. But looking back, we realized how much more when OpenTable came along. They had been partnering with us for years. We've been doing stuff together. And they cared about the product we had built and the same cause that we built it for, which was helping people discover great restaurants and Chinese things. And so uh, I realized like you can't always you can't always have the luxury of choosing. And I wouldn't even say that we did, but we at the same time were really fortunate to find a company that uh, shared not have to just uh, you know sell ourselves short because we wanted to like because we wanted to, to get the deal. We were able to find a company that aligned with our vision. And that's why. And having that clear sense of your story and your, your vision is so important. Okay, opening up to questions. Um, you had such a great idea when you first had it, and I'm just wondering, how did you protect your idea from being copied? Or, or so I'm just going to repeat the question. How did you protect your idea from being copied? So I think that's one of the uh, first things that first intuitions of a founder when they come up with an idea is like to kind of not share the idea and kind of protect it. And one of the first things they told me when I took this entrepreneurship class with Women 2.0 was don't be afraid to share your idea. That the, uh, the amount of effort to copy an idea or to like steal someone else's idea and run off with it is so much greater than the, or like the benefits of sharing your idea are so much greater than the risk that some random person has nothing better to do than steal your idea. Because like everybody's busy, everybody has the project they're working on, and um, they also have to have the capacity and the resources to build it out better than you, and the passion to do it better than you. And the chances of that happening are small. And then once you launch your idea, people are going to copy it anyway. And I think that's the other thing I realized is once Food Spotting came out, a million Food Spotting clones popped up. And for us, it was just the important thing was sticking to our story and not freaking out and just copying competitors and things like that. Um, I know Josh Williams from Goala wrote a really interesting retrospective on Goala and how tempted they were to copy Foursquare uh, or they were pressured to copy a lot of things that Foursquare was doing instead of sticking to the thing that made Goala different and great, which was the game and the objects and stuff like that. Um, and so that's why it's so important to have a story and stick to it and not worry about the competition that people are coming along. Stop her, she was making her hands go up. All right, you. Yeah. Oh, uh, what do you believe uh, in your opinion, is the kindest way to deliver an idea uh, while still retaining rights to that idea, yet allowing others to collaborate with a new idea, like under the same umbrella? So like, as you're bringing on other people, how do you retain kind of the ownership of your idea? Uh, yeah, and, and profit off of it without uh, getting greedy. Yeah, so that's a good question. So as you're starting a company, uh, it is important to think about like the equity structure of your yeah. company, for example. I mean, I think that's the most tangible manifestation of what you're talking about. Um, and you need to figure out how to balance attracting great people like my co-founder, Ted, and uh, my other co-founder, Soraya, and holding on to that equity. And so I've seen people kind of on both ends of the spectrum who are like people who are, you know, they so much want to hold on to that equity that they're not, they're not willing to give it away to attract the right people. They, or they, they want to offer like five percent to a technical co-founder or something. When a technical co-founder is, is critical to your business, like you want them to have almost like half your company. Um, but one of the things that you know we that I was advised to do is always make sure you have the control of that company and that interest, and that you have the right terms in there, so that if the person leaves after three months, that they're not running off with half the company yeah. or going after half the company. And so, what I would recommend tactically is make really good friends with a lawyer. <laughs> and have a really have a really great lawyer from the start when you have that idea. Anyone and actually think, yeah, right. <laughs> uh -huh. And so like our startup lawyer was like one of the best advisors, connectors, and people that we had in our te early team. And he helped us both guide us through the fundraising process and uh, also you know protect the interests, but also know when to be reasonable and generous to attract the yeah. right people. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Why did you say put it down? Be like, yes, mine. Make mine the last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question about Startup Beacon, did you go in by yourself and like, or with someone else, or did you, and like, what did you hope to get out of it? 
So I did a couple events actually. I did iPhone Dev Camps and Startup Weekend. When I first went to iPhone Dev Camp, I was by myself, and I pitched the idea and told people to meet me by the food and just had people join that were interested. At Startup Weekend, I actually brought someone who I was considering as a co potential co-founder along. And then we also shared the idea and had other people join our team for the weekend. Um, no, what was the second part of your question? Like, so the biggest thing that I got out, like, since I didn't end up finding a co-founder through the um, hackathon type of events was just the connections. I, mean, I met people in market research, I met angel investors, I met lawyers, um, and I met a lot of people in just different fields and industries that weren't just the engineers and designers that I knew. And it really broadened my network, uh, which became so important all throughout the fundraising and partnership and growing uh, process. Awesome. Let's give a listen again. Uh, and I'm happy. I'll, I'll hang around to answer questions. I'm Lady Lexi on Twitter. L-A-D-Y-L-E-X-Y. If you have questions, too.